Hello class and welcome to this module on art of the Americas before 1300. Of course there is so much art that came out of the Americas and this region after 1300, but as I've said before, this is an introductory course. I want you guys to be getting the most foundational knowledge that you can and then I want you to, on your own, do some research, find what makes you curious and keep exploring. But I want you guys to have this kind of foundational bedrock of knowledge. So one thing I wanna talk about is that the year 1300 CE is an artificial cutoff date. It doesn't really have any correspondence to the actual timeline of cultural development in pre-Columbian Americas. Um, but the pre-Columbian, or the pre-1300 time frame, it provides the opportunity to discuss the majority of pre-Columbian cultures of the Americas, with the exception of the Aztecs and the Incas. Um, their timeline, the Aztecs is 1325 to 1521, and the Incas is 1438 to 1534, which is kind of interesting to think about. Like, this is all going on here um while over in europe that's the same time as basically the renaissance um so we'll we'll talk for the first half of class on mesoamerica and then for the second half we'll talk about pre-columbian caribbean and the andes um and the artworks we're going to cover are um the colossal head from olmec culture uh, the pyramid of the sun from teotihuacan culture uh, Lintel 24, which is of Shield Jaguar and Lady Hook. Uh, the Colossal Antlantids, colossal part of the Toltec culture. The Zemis, part of the Taino culture. Uh, Raimondo Stella, which is from Peru. The Embroidered Funerary Mantle, which is from Peru as well. The Hummingbird Geoglyph, which is from Peru and the Nazca culture. The portrait pot from the Moche culture of Peru, and the gateway of the sun, which is part of the Tiwanaku culture of Bolivia. Um, and then these, all of these artifacts come from before 1300. So, um, show here. Oops, the slides are taking a minute to load. So here we have a map of the Aztec Empire and the uh, Mayan zone of influence. So what we're looking at here is considered Mesoamerica, which literally means middle of America, and it refers to Mexico and Central America. And then when we go deeper into the module, when we're studying the Andes, that refers to Andean mountain chains in South America. And I'll be using the word pre-Columbian a lot, and, and this is in order to emphasize Columbus's role in this time period. Uh, this language intends to correct and mitigate the prevailing Eurocentric worldview that has been historically imposed on the Americas, um, and that's how it's often obscured recognition of indigenous influence, achievement, and their rights. So, um, yeah, this could invoke some debate um, and provide a very succinct inroad to discussing issues of identity that arise frequently from American art and the art of the Americas. Um, but in this lecture, we use pre-Columbian exclusively just for purposes of clarity. And what some of the illustrations represent on this map um, is part of the themes that we'll be studying. Uh, art as a form of communication. So what do these sort of objects communicate? Um, the intersections between art and ritual. So a lot of these are part of um, sacred processes. And then the continuity of cultures. So this kind of shows this connective um, web of influence between these different cultures. Um, and the word pre-Columbian art is not only for the aesthetic qualities, but 
It's for the various roles that were played in Mesoamerican and Caribbean and Andean societies. Um, so the iconographical and stylistic interconnectedness of these various pre-Columbian objects will give you a better sense of how different cultures were interacting and borrowing from each other. So featured here, we have the colossal head that belongs to the Olmec culture. It's one of the earliest pre-Columbian civilizations in Mesoamerica. It was originally referred to as the mother culture of Mexico by the famed Mexican intellectual Miguel Covarrubias. He's a scholar, uh, has um, since revised this theory in light of archaeological discoveries of contemporaneous cultures located in the Valley of Oaxaca. Nevertheless, the Olmec produced tremendous architectural complexes and monumental monumental sculptures that have captivated the attention of archaeologists and enthusiasts for the past century. Perhaps most impressive in the corpus of Olmec visual culture are the colossal heads. They're made out of basalt, which is quarried from the nearby Tukla Mountains. Some of them are up to nine feet high and weigh 28 tons. The heads are incredibly naturalistic, so they kind of possess uh, this impressive individualism. Their expressions vary from downturned to frowning mouths um, to more placid expressions. Some even feature crossed eyes, which some art historians interpret as signifying a trance-like state, which suggests that these individuals represented may have um, been participating in hallucinogens as a means of transporting themselves to a supernatural realm, which is a practice shared by a number of pre-Columbian civilizations throughout the Americas. And these heads likely depict rulers that were frequently recarved or even defaced after their death. And the act of ritually defacing the stone may have served as a means to physically mark the former ruler's death. Uh, but this practice also enabled these Olmec artists to recycle these um, big stones, these big, heavy basalt boulders, um, which were transported from the Tutla Mountains, and that required this enormous amount of manpower, given the absence of the wheel in the pre-Columbian Americas. Um, so now we'll talk about Teotihuacan. Uh, this is a civilization located about 30 miles northeast of where we have Mexico City today. It was the first urbanized center in all of the Americas, and you can see from this map how expansive it was. It had a population of about 125 thousand inhabitants at the height of its rule during 600 CE. The city of Teotihuacan is the largest city in the Americas and the sixth largest in the entire world. It contained over 2,200 apartment compounds arranged along a grid. Um, sorry, go back a slide, which you can see a little bit clearer this grid system um, and the most prominent building of the um, Teotihuacan civilization is the Pyramid of the Sun. It was constructed early in the site's history around 150 to 25 CE. The colossal pyramid was built atop a sacred cave and was probably intended to honor one of Teotihuacan's rulers. The pyramid was constructed using the talud tablero technique, which consists of a sloped talud and a, a vertical tablero uh, to create its telltale stepped appearance. Um, you can see this um, being used here as well. Um, and then this architectural signature was disseminated throughout Mesoamerica and also can be found on Mayan pyramids throughout southern Mexico and Guatemala. Um, and here you can see it's being used on the Temple of the Feathered Serpent and then 
we see these um, additional close-up details featuring um, what is believed to be the feathered serpent. And then we will cover next the one of the more impressive artworks produced by the Maya culture. And here is a, another map of the Mayan culture in the Mayan region. Um, this is a ball court, um, kind of giving you an example again of the way these Mayan pyramids are kind of not copying, but gaining some inspiration from Teotihuacan. So here is that Lintel 24, the shield jaguar and lady hawk from the site of Yaxilan. This stone relief carving depicts shield jaguar, one of Yaxilan's kings who ruled from years 681 to 742 CE. Uh, his Maya name was, and I'm definitely going to butcher this, so I hope you take a look at the, um, the transcript as well. It's Samnaj Baalam II, and he stands in profile with a torch in hand while his wife, Lady Hulk, kneels before him. She is engaged in a common form of elite bloodletting, which is pass, she's passing this obsidian lace rope through her tongue, and the droplets of blood are collected in a small container filled with paper. Um, in a subsequent lintel, um, here we go. A stylized serpent-like cloud emanates from the container, representing the burning paper. The paper served as a conduit for converting sacrificial blood into smoke, and then into a substance that the lintel demonstrates. Um, is a transformative and otherworldly substance. Uh, and then the shield jaguar is positioned directly in the mouth of this zoomorphized serpent smoke plume. If you can see that um, depicted in the lentil. And um, he's pointing a spear directly at a at Lady Hook who looks frightened um, as if she's being overtaken by what she's seeing and participating in. Uh, glyphs lining the edge of the perimeter of the relief carving identify the subject matter and date of each lentil. The images were originally positioned above the southeast doorway of the site's main temples. Archaeologists have interpreted this lentil as a glorification of Lady Hoke's political capabilities, given her decision to have herself represented. Um, and she's represented as a key facilitator to shield Jaguar's transformation. These lentils really serve as the first documented instance of a female artistic patronage in the ancient Americas. So it's very interesting to see this kind of patronage happening um, with a woman showing her political stance. And across the Gulf of Mexico, um, sorry, not across the Gulf. Um, this is centered at the modern day city of Tula, Mexico. Um, it was greatly admired by the Aztec situ uh, civilization. It is the Toltec culture. Um, and the Aztecs frequently emulated the artistic and architectural style of the Toltec. Um, but this, this particular cultural civilization center uh, marked the site where the famous Aztec god Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, was thought to reside. The site's colossal Atlantids are anthropomorphized architectural supports that originally held up the roof of the temple, 
The stiff, dignified figures wear feather headdresses and butterfly pectorals. Um, I'm going to pause here. 